the way. So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on the state of eviction in PA and a deep dive into Delaware County data. The Housing Opportunities Program for Equity, also known as HOPE for short, at the Foundation for Delaware County, along with the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania, are thrilled to host today's webinar on evictions and the corresponding Delaware County data. The folks at Eviction Lab, ran by Matthew Desmond, the author of the book Evicted, tell us the lack of affordable housing sits at the root of a host of social problems, from poverty to homelessness to educational disparities in healthcare. That means understanding the eviction crisis is critical to effectively addressing these problems and reducing inequality. When you hear the data today, I think the interconnectedness and impact of evictions in our own community will begin to crystallize. So while we listen to today's presentation, it will be important for us to begin thinking about how best to curtail this eviction crisis in Delaware County based on the information that will be provided to us. Now, before we officially get started, I'd like to go over a few items so everyone knows how to participate in today's webinar. All webinar attendees are participating in silent or listening only mode. We welcome your participation using the chat feature and encourage you to sign in today by using your, by listing your name and organization so that others know, know which colleagues are in attendance. Please make sure that you select all attendees and participants in the chat so that others can see your comments. To raise a question, please use the Q&A feature located across the bottom of your screen. This will help the panelists and the moderators see your question so that we can answer it during the question and answer portion at the end of the webinar today. This event is being recorded and will be shared via the foundation social media page and also sent out to all attendees along with the slides following the event. So with that, I would now like to welcome our main presenter from the our main presenters from the Housing Alliance, beginning with Ms. Gail Schwartz. Gail? Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you. Thank you to uh, the Delaware County Foundation for inviting us to be a part of this conversation. My name is Gail Schwartz, and I am the Associate Director of Policy and Programs for the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. I'm joined by my coworker, Chi Han Kim, and uh, to help start us off in today's conversation, I do want to just give an overview of the eviction process and where the opportunities are to disrupt the process. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Bear with me. All right. So what we have here is an eviction process map. It starts with the notice to quit. Uh, it's uh, written into the Pennsylvania landlord tenant law that uh, a notice to quit uh, can go for 10 days if it's for non-payment of rent and 15 days for lease violations that um, for a lease that is one year or shorter and then 30 days for lease violations other than non-payment for leases that uh, are longer than one year. So there's a couple of things that can happen along this process. A lot of times we know that when people get the notice to quit, they leave the property right away. Uh, but if they do stay in the property and the notice to quit expires, then the landlord goes to uh, the local magistrate and files the landlord tenant complaint. And then a court summons is served, there is a hearing. If the judgment is in favor of the tenant, then the tenant of course gets to stay. If the judgment is uh, in favor of the landlord, it may include uh, a, an amount owed, uh, an award of some money, and it may not. Uh, it also might have something that's called a pay and stay. So there's a window for the tenant to pay the full amount of rental arrears. And if they do that before uh, the, uh, the order of the possession happens, which is the actual physical ejectment of, of a person from their home, then uh, they can stay in the apartment. So there's a pay and stay, or sometimes people are just simply ordered to, to leave. The lease is terminated no matter what. 
Um, there is an opportunity to file an appeal. Tenants do get to stay in the apartment uh, when they, or the rental when they do get to uh, file an appeal. And then there's the last step, which is the landlord files uh, an order of possession. And this is it. So it's, you know, this process can take probably as, as few as uh, a couple of weeks, like three weeks, but oftentimes it, it tends to run about six weeks. So now let's think about all the ways that we can disrupt the process. So there are definitely different points to disrupt the process. You know, there's the notice to quit. This is like all of the things that you can do before even, you know, destable, uh, the destabilizing event happens. So, you know, emergency rental assistance or mediation or things like that. Uh, there are interventions that can be done when the complaint is filed, at the court hearing, when the summons is served, uh, when judgment is issued for the pay and stay, the appeal and the order of possession. So even though this is a, a big lengthy process, uh, there are definitely uh, many points where we can just kind of get an off ramp and help stabilize the tenant and make sure that landlords are also made whole. So let's start with a notice to quit. Uh, right now in Pennsylvania, it is completely uh, legal for landlords to include a waiver of the notice to quit. So you know, we could really encourage landlords to always include a, a notice to quit clause in their leases. Like I said, there is landlord tenant mediation, you know, easily accessible legal advice, and of course, rental assistance to help address any debts. Then, you know, at the next point where a complaint is filed, some of the ways that you can disrupt the eviction process at this point is again, landlord tenant mediation and access to high quality legal advice, rental assistance. Uh, this is where, you know, getting some partnerships with the courts can be really, really promising. Uh, getting courts to promote alternative dispute resolution and uh, other good faith efforts to resolve the dispute before filing. You know, at the point when the summons is served, this is when, you know, you get your notice in the mail, uh, additional information can be included with that summons. So something that really explains in plain terms what, where the tenant is in the process and what their options are. And of course, you know, still having access to legal advice and rental assistance, and as well as, you know, again, what we've seen in uh, different parts of the state is, you know, partnerships with the court where the courts are contacting a partner agency to provide support or assistance to the tenant. Now we get to the court hearing. Uh, there are lawyer for a day programs. There are rental assistance programs. Again, you know, third party judge referral to an alternative dispute resolution program or mediation. Uh, having partner agencies on site to assist with any underlying cause for the housing instability and uh, explicit judicial guidance for uh, magisterial district judges to take in good faith efforts or take into consideration good faith efforts when hearing a case. You know, <clears throat> yes, the tenant is behind on rent, but they're applying for programs and they're trying to get help. Nope. Then at the point when we see a judgment for a landlord, of course, rental assistance is still very helpful in diverting eviction at this point. Mediation can be helpful at diverting uh, eviction at this point. Um, whether it's, you know, still trying to save uh, the housing situation or helping come up with a plan to have the tenant successfully transition to a new housing opportunity without the forcible displacement. Uh, partner agencies on site and, of course, um, legal assistance in filing an appeal. 
And then with the pay it and stay, of course, if it's pay and stay, rental assistance is still absolutely a, a critical tool that can be used at this junction of the eviction process. Landlord tenant mediation can still work at this point in the process. Uh, you know, having partner agencies uh, working with tenants and landlords, uh, addressing underlying causes, uh, helping transition if that's what needs to happen to a new home. And then any uh, additional information provided to the tenant really should be in very simple lay terms to help them uh, understand where they are in the process. The next spot we have is, you know, filing an appeal. Again, rental assistance can be helpful in this situation, but also looking at including direct to tenant payments if landlords are really resistant to uh, working with programs and working with the tenant at this point. Of course, landlord tenant mediation is still helpful at this point in the process. You want legal assistance to make sure that you are filing uh, court paperwork uh, well and right. You don't want it to be dismissed over uh, something minor technical misfile. Um, we've also seen a, a couple of counties start to create a housing court at the common pleas level. And then lastly, this is the point where, you know, the order of possession. So uh, the judge issues this, and this is when, you know, a constable, a uh, sheriff, uh, you know, some sort of law enforcement entity comes to the home and actually puts out uh, the person living there. So again, rental assistance, uh, including direct tenant payments, you know, for those uh, landlords who are resistant to work with agencies, Mediation can still be helpful at this point. And of course, you really want to be working closely with partner agencies to support tenants in finding new housing. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to pass it over to my coworker, Chihan, who can give a deeper dive into what the eviction data tells us. Thanks so much, Gail. Uh, and I want to echo Gail in thanking the foundation for hosting us. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to share our findings with you and hope um, this knowledge helps catalyze some um, action. And please forgive me if I, if I cough sometimes during the uh, presentation, I'm having a bit of a sore throat. All right, let's dive in. So I want to start by giving you an overview of how many eviction filings have been made in Delaware County. Um, so this chart comes from a tracker that the Legal Services Corporation is maintaining. Uh, and this shows you how many eviction cases have been filed in Delaware County since January of 2020. So uh, you see there is a, quite a bit of variability here. Or one thing that jumps out is the gap be between um, March and April to September of 2020, which was when there was a statewide uh, court closure and a moratorium for eviction filings. So in Delaware County, there were virtually zero filings during that time. But as soon as that was lifted, there was a big spike and the CDC eviction moratorium uh, came into effect just right after that. So from August, uh, sorry, from August of um, 2020 to August of 2021. And in recent months, as you can see, uh, filings have been climbing. Um, and in April, they affected about 500 families, rent families in Delaware County. Um, I also want to, I also want to give you some uh, historical context into those numbers. So the dotted line here shows you the average uh, number of filings per month. Uh, between 2016 and 2019. So you can see kind of before depending on what the baseline was, which is already very high at a crisis level. And as you can see, kind of the moratoria and some of the protections that were available last year um, held those numbers down. But since the moratoriums have expired, uh, numbers have been growing uh, pretty quickly. And as of the last three months have already reached uh, historic filing levels. 
Um, there's a bit of a hint of it going down in April, um, but there's generally uh, more filings in the first few months of the year and a decline, and, and they generally tend to climb in the, in the rest of the year. So, his, uh, so year to date, uh, as of uh, May 15th, uh, the LSE, LSE tracker is reporting that there were uh, 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 number of evictions, if the trend continues, will eclipse the number of evictions that were filed in 2019 in Delaware County. Uh, one important caveat that I want to note is that this only includes, of course, court-based eviction system. So any so-called informal evictions that happens to, for any number of reasons, that would not involve a formal filing in the courts would not be reflected here. So this is not the full spectrum of housing instability and displacement a renter can experience in the Delaware County, but only uh, uh, tracks those instances where the courts are involved, which is also, which is still important to consider because of course those records do stay with the renter in Pennsylvania and can really seriously harm the ability of a person to find uh, rental housing in the future. Um, but uh, I believe uh, I'll put the link into the chat after my presentation. And I believe this uh, slides could also be shared with you, but you can also uh, Go to this tracker yourself to find, uh, to interact with their data and uh, keep up with uh, the data in the future. It's uh, very, pretty frequently updated. So that is an overview of the filings, but uh, we wanted to take a bit of a deeper dive. So um, it doesn't tell you uh, how eviction cases uh, progress after they have been filed. And uh, it doesn't tell you, just a pure number of filings doesn't tell you which areas in the county are most affected by eviction filings. So we wanted to do that. And in order to do that, we request data from the state courts, the administrative office of the Pennsylvania courts. And we made a public electronic records request, in, which included uh, quite a bit of um, case level data, which will be the analysis of which we'll be presenting uh, in a few moments. And this data comes from 2021, uh, and we're often going to compare that to uh, the data in 2019 to see if anything has changed during uh, the pandemic. I wanted to start with this because I think it very um, visually, in a striking way, lays bare some of the deep inequalities that we see that are underlying eviction filings and all the consequences that Jordan mentioned that follow from that. So. This map is a map of eviction filing rates in all the zip codes in Delaware County. So the color coding, um, you can see the legend there, but I want to emphasize all the zip codes that are highlighted in yellow. Those are zip codes where the filing rate is 5% or higher. Uh, just to translate that, that means about one in 20 of the renter families in those zip codes received an eviction filing in 2021. So one in 20, I think it's a pretty sobering number. And so I just wanted to, you know, somewhat something of an arbitrary line, but I do want to point that out. And you can see the zip codes in yellow uh, include uh, most parts of the Eastern part of the county, as well as the areas uh, around Chester and Marcus Hook. Um, one caveat though is of course zip codes are not people um, and zip codes usually have quite a, a great diversity of communities in them, uh, but our data uh, doesn't allow us to look um, further into that, unfortunately. But I think even at this level, the patterns are pretty striking. Another way of looking at that is kind of get at what um, what uh, do these zip codes look like in terms of the factors that might pre predict eviction filing rates. So we know from the research uh, done by uh, Eviction Lab of Princeton, among uh, other folks, that, um, some, uh, that uh, factors like uh, the renter's race can have a very big effect. One factor they found uh, over and over again is family with children, especially those headed by women, uh, are at a special risk of eviction filings. And we also see that in Delaware County specifically. So this is looking at all the cases from 2021, uh, broken down by zip code. Uh, of course, there are lots of zip codes, but here we've isolated the ones with a filing rate that is higher than 5%. So it's, and it's uh, arranged in the order of filing rate. And you see that uh, the orange highlights, those are uh, the, the zip codes in the county that have the top uh, percentage of the renter households of color living in the county, renter households headed by women with children living in the zip code, excuse me, and the percentage in the zip code who are rent burden. And you can see most of these high filing uh, zip codes have one or more of those factors uh, 
and reflect one of the more of those factors. So for example, in zip code 19123 in Darby, 83% uh, of the renters there are renters of color, 29% of renters there are headed by women with children, and 57% of renters there are paying more than 30% of their income on rent. So I think this is a pretty striking, just you know, in a one glance uh, visualization uh, that these factors are often going together with high filing rates. So this is not a, this is a pattern that really impacts um, fundamentally equity in Delaware County, especially because of all the downstream effects that follow from an eviction filing. And what happens after an eviction case is filed? Uh, we can look at what happens during the court or just before the hearing, whether a case is found for the plaintiff, which is generally the landlord, found for the defendant, the tenant, whether a case is withdrawn or settled between the parties or is dismissed by the judge. And if you, uh, there are two uh, facets here, but the one on the right is just Delaware County. And the two colored bars represent two different years. Uh, the top bar in navy is 2019. The bottom bar in yellow is 2021. And you can see in both years, the vast majority of cases were found for the plaintiff. Um, though, especially in Delaware County uh, in 2021, uh, that was uh, somewhat less likely than before the pandemic and more cases were being withdrawn or settled. But even so, uh, only in 2021, only 2% of cases were found for the defendant, 16% were withdrawn and 11% were settled. And 66% were found, two thirds were found for the plaintiff. And again, on the slide, there's a link where you can, where you can follow um, a, a interactive chart uh, on the web and you can look at all the other counties in Pennsylvania other than Philadelphia. Uh, as Gail mentioned, the order of possession is an important point to consider because it's the legal order that um, authorized the legal lockout of the tenant. In 2021, at least 29% of cases that were filed uh, resulted in or an order of possession being issued. Um, I say at least because we might have missed some cases that had an order of possession issued in 2022 that uh, we didn't get in the data. Um, but that was a much lower percentage than in 2019, uh, when 44% of cases were issued and issued an order of possession. So we don't know exactly what the cause of this was. Um, I think uh, quite possibly it would have to do with the eviction moratoria, which uh, often allowed uh, landlords to pursue a case come up to the point of eviction. And um, some of this could also have to do with the success of uh, the emergency rental assistance program. But in any case, there was a, a large uh, percentage difference between 2019 and 2021. And we are uh, going to be examining 2022 data uh, in the next few months to see um, how things have been uh, going in 2022. Although we do see hints that as uh, the eviction moratorium expired at the end of 2021, um, more orders of possession will probably be issued. Uh, and the shift is also seen statewide. Uh, one caveat here is that um, there are many uh, ways that you could still be evicted as a result of the process without the sheriff going to your door and knocking. Um, for example, a tenant could leave uh, at a, either out of pressure or in order to avoid uh, the sheriff coming to your door uh, after a case is decided for the plaintiff. And we wouldn't know um, that exact rate here, but this is the be uh, best uh, proxy we have in our data. Um, so uh, one thing that um, does suggest a lot of points for intervention here is that um, there, there is a period of time where a case uh, could even be filed and even be heard, but not proceed far enough for a formal legal eviction, uh, which uh, going back to Gail's presentation does leave um, many points of intervention um, where that final eviction can be, could be prevented. And also uh, for for cases where those things could not be prevented, it highlights some of the potential benefits of sealing the records um, after the case is finished and other anti-discrimination policies to make it uh, easier for tenants to find new housing, um, even if they've been displaced as, uh, as a result of the eviction process. And how quickly does the process happen? Well, the answer is fairly quick. Um, so the median number of days from a case being filed to the judge hearing the case or some kind of disposition being reached in the case is 15 days, uh, so about two weeks. 
And the median number of days of filing to an actual order of possession, if one is issued, is a little lo uh, longer than, than a month. Um, as Gail said, that there's a range of different, uh, there's a range of uh, timeframes uh, that different cases see, but uh, because of the timelines that are um, part of the Landlord Tenant Act, most cases do get resolved uh, within uh, about a month. And this is a pattern that's similar statewide. We can also look at how many, how much money do tenants owe. So most cases uh, do involve money. Um, and the uh, money judgment can include uh, all the costs and fees that are accrued as part of uh, the case having been uh, filed and heard. And it can, it can include rent and rears and other kinds of damages. So um, there's also a pretty large range of numbers here, but the median amount that a tenant was uh, ordered to pay to the landlord in 2021 was a little uh, more than $2,300, uh, somewhat higher than in 2019. And 17% of all money judgments were actually for less than $1,000. So a lot of these cases are being filed for relatively small amounts of money. And the vast majority of cases do involve rent and arrears. Uh, we don't know what other factors could have been involved. Uh, rent and arrears is often not the only factor, but in 90% of cases that actually were found in favor of the landlord, um, the landlord was awarded rent and arrears. And the median rents for cases where we have this data was about 900 in 2021. So these, are, uh, these cases are affecting families that are paying relatively little in rent. And given the amount of uh, money that is in arrears compared to the rent uh, that was recorded in the case, we see that uh, about two thirds of the cases are filed with uh, that involve three or fewer months of rent in arrears. Uh, but we don't ever want to end with just the problems and without talking about the potential solutions. So. Um, at the Housing Alliance, we've looked at two uh, local programs that have contributed to uh, significantly addressing the rental uh, the eviction crisis in two local communities in PA. Um, uh, we'll be considering them here and what impact those programs have had on the eviction uh, process. Um, the first is one that was uh, launched during the pandemic by the Friends Association in Chester County. Um, this is a program that three uh, magisterial district judges participated. MDJs are the judges at the local level who hear the eviction cases. And um, this program addresses uh, many of the intervention points that Gail was talking about in the presentation. So um, they are able to reach out to tenants before the hearing, um, get information from them about what might have led to this filing. Um, uh, understand what uh, where they're coming from and what their background is. And they're able to offer help at the eviction hearing, both in terms of legal assistance and in terms of coordination with the courts and navigation at the courtroom. Um, and through this, they've been able to negotiate with landlords, uh, often to resolve the cases with rental assistance and other supports um, and to settle or otherwise uh, uh, resolve the case without the tenant being displaced. And one important aspect of this program is that as this program has worked and has kind of proven its success, landlords have uh, been more and more proactively reaching out to them in order to resolve uh, any issues with their tenants before they get to a filing. And that's one re re uh, way these kinds of programs can also head off uh, the evictions process before filings have actually been made. So in the next few slides, I'm going to present some of their analysis of uh, the eviction outcomes that we get from our data. Um, the charts can be a little bit um, crowded, so let me just walk you through step by step. So this is looking at those uh, case outcomes at the disposition. So there are two facets here. The top is uh, cases uh, that are filed in 2019 and decided in 2019, and the bottom is cases that were decided in 2021. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the gold bars, the yellow bars. Those are cases that were filed in the participating courtrooms um, that had all those uh, legal assistance and supports available to the tenants uh, that were being filed against in those courtrooms. The Navy bars were all, were all other courts in Chester County. And in, if you look at the top part here in 2019, 
Uh, if you look at judgments for plaintiff, there's very little difference. The vast majority is still found for the plaintiff. And really, there's not very much difference for all of the other categories. But there is a pretty significant difference in 2021, where judgments for plaintiff uh, were cut almost by half in the participating courts, but didn't budge at elsewhere in Chester County. And cases were almost three times more uh, likely to be withdrawn for the participating courtrooms between 2019 and 2021. And settlements became two and a half times more likely uh, for the participating courtrooms. And of course, um, you know, a lot of things intervened between 2019 and 2021, including the pandemic. But uh, then that's why we wanted to compare with elsewhere in Chester County, uh, which also experienced the pandemic and all the kind of the fallout from the pandemic. And in those other courtrooms that are not participating, we don't see very much difference at all, which does uh, suggest to us that this program was having pretty significant effect for many hundreds of families who were participating in the program. And we can also look at the orders of possession and this is kind of the final final uh, food of the pudding here. And again, the, the same structure as last slide. In 2019, very little difference between the participating courts uh, and elsewhere. Um, remember in 2019, the program had not been in effect yet. So th this is basically the control condition. In 2021 though, the rates did drop uh, across the county. They dropped much more in the courts that are participating, dropping almost by two thirds in the participating courts once the program had started. And um, we also looked at a program that's operating in Reading in Berks County. Um, this program involves uh, one courtroom uh, that is headed by Judge Tanya Butler. Um, and Reading is uh, one community that is, uh, is sh really struggling with the eviction crisis. So this uh, program also uh, strikes at multiple uh, of those intervention points. And one thing it does uh, is with the packet that goes out to the tenants one, when they're filed against their eviction, one interesting fact is that information does not once mention the word eviction. Um, so there is a, sp a special packet that goes out with that uh, notice of hearing that tells the tenant that they are at risk of eviction and important tells them what they can do about it. And this has been really important because it really raises the rates of um, the tenants showing up in eviction court um, where otherwise they, they wouldn't have any opportunity to be heard at all. And this notice is, you know, even painted, uh, even uh, printed on a paper of a different color, and is available both in English and Spanish, because of course there are uh, many uh, Spanish-speaking families in Reading. And at courtroom, there is an uh, opportunity for uh, legal assistance and representation uh, at the courtroom, and for the attorney to raise a lot of issues that the tenant might not know to raise in in, in their in the defense of the case. And we see really similar results um, of this program. Uh, the structure of the uh, chart is here the same. It, the highlighted bar in uh, gold is uh, all the cases are filed in Judge Brother's courtroom, which, who was uh, participating in the program. One thing that I've added here is the gray bars, which are other courts in Reading, which uh, for some reasons might be different than uh, courts elsewhere in Berks County. But really the pattern here is the same in 2020, 2019, before the program started. Um, case outcomes are fairly similar all across the county, but dramatic differences emerged in 2021, where judgments for plaintiff go way down. And uh, making up for that, judgment to defendant go way up, and uh, cases are uh, almost four times more likely to, to be withdrawn compared to the same courtroom before the program started. And in, uh, in contrast to that, other courts, in, whether in Reading or elsewhere in Berks County, didn't really change very much uh, between 2019 and 2021, even with the pandemic, in terms of these outcomes. And also with the orders of possession, um, order of possession went down by more than, than half in Judge Butler's courtroom between 2019 and 2021, uh, after the program started, and declined much less in other courts in the same county. So these are just two kind of overviews of two programs that have worked. Um, and it just suggests that really, uh, if there's thoughtful interventions, they can have major effects in, in, the, in, in the lives of many different families. Um, while also um, these same programs make landlords whole by connecting uh, tenants and landlords to programs like emergency rental assistance. Um, and then that's shown by how many cases were uh, withdrawn or settled, uh, which means that either the landlord has to do that proactively or through negotiation with the tenants. To finish, um, I just want to draw your attention to our full report on PA eviction data, which is at our website. 
um, that covers kind of the statewide uh, statewide patterns, but uh, a lot of the analyses you can filter through by county by interacting uh, with the charts. And uh, we really hope you check it out. We'll be updating this in the coming months uh, with data from 2022, because I know things have been changing um, potentially pretty quickly. If you have any questions at this meeting or, or elsewhere, um, please let me know. Uh, there's, there's my contact information. There. Thank you. And uh, I'll hand it back to Jordan. Thank you so much, Chi Young and Gail. That was, that was great. Um, so this is the Q&A portion of our uh, webinar today. And we have about a little more than a half an hour left. So please put your questions in the chat if you have them. Uh, we do have one question so far. So it says in Berks and Chester County, uh, eviction intervention programs, are non-legal intervention services used, particularly uh, housing counselors? Um, so Gail can, can supplement me on this, but I believe the Berks program is actually a really grassroots program. It's really handled by, I think, really just three people. Uh, one is a lawyer, one is uh, a person with the Reading, uh, City of Reading uh, Human Resources Commission, um, and one is the, the, the participating judge. Um, and so in terms of housing counseling, I don't know if anything like that is offered there. With Chester County, I know that um, a friends association that, that's a venerable uh, associate uh, uh, nonprofit that offers a lot of services. I'm not sure if housing counseling specifically is one of them, but I know they connect to uh, a whole range of different social supports. Yeah, <clears throat> that's my understanding as well. Um, the the Burks program very much operates like a, a lawyer for a, a day program, and you're really just getting the the legal assistance. Uh, however, with um, the Friends Association program, it's a little bit more robust, and they have a lot of uh, services in house to help uh, address the underlying issues uh, that cause the housing instability. Great. Um, as the questions come in, I'll ask I'll ask a few as we wait. Um, Chian, on one of your slides, you, uh, when you were identifying the the hotspots in Delaware County, and you had the breakdown between you know families with children and race. But your last columns had a uh, rent burden percentage. Can you describe what rent burden means? Because we saw that some of those numbers were as high as fifty seven and sixty four percent, and the lowest that I saw was still as high as thirty seven percent. Yeah, so rent burden, um, I'm taking kind of the mo most common definition, which means when you pay more than 30% of your income on your rent, and which uh, often leaves very little for all the, all the other expenses that we need for life, like food and healthcare and transportation. Right, exactly. So, you know, the, the, the HUD definition, I believe, around uh, that 30% rule that is so common amongst the housing folks is 30% of your household expenses, right? Um, should, it should be lower than 30%. So that includes not only your rent, but utilities as well. So if we're seeing families that have 64 and 57% on rent, and we're not including utilities, uh, and our lowest that we saw on that list was 37%, right, which is already too high, I think that's indication of a real problem. And as we see that most of these evictions are being filed for rent, I think there's a direct correlation there between you know, that rent burden percentage and uh, in some of these filings, which is which is really important. Obviously, it speaks to a larger issue about affordability, but I just wanted to, to point that out. Um, here's another question that just came in, Great. Are there particular landlords that are responsible for large volumes of eviction filings in the county? Um, so I haven't looked at that specifically for Delaware County. Um, and uh, I don't... So it's, it's a little difficult to look at that in the data because um, of course, a lot of landlords uh, don't operate by the same name. Um, so, you know, they could be uh, ABC LLC and XYZ LLC that are owned by the same person, but it's really difficult to tell. Um, yeah, so I can't, I, can speak, I can't speak specifically to Delco, unfortunately. Another question, this may not be for you, but um, who do participants go to for evictions from Sharon Hill due to no compliance of living arrangements, if you know? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if that if that uh, locality has any um, uh, registry or enforce, uh, code enforcement official. Right, um, so that's a good point. I would, 
I would advise that that family and participant to do exactly as you said, speak to their local court enforcement, but also reach out to uh, legal aid of Southeastern PA, and they will they will probably give you at least some advice around that issue. They're great. Um, as the questions continue to come in, I'll, I'll keep filling in. Uh, we are seeing, and this goes a little bit to the rent burden thing, but we're seeing a spike in the cost of things like food, rent, utilities, and fuel. So do you anticipate that these numbers that you presented today with these increased costs will impact the number of eviction filings in Delaware County moving forward? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great point, especially because you know, rents are is a big driver of rising costs. And... Um, that really increases the competition for housing and, you know, landlords, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not a renter's market. So landlords might be more willing to file an eviction uh, rather than hold out um, and, and trying to work with the tenant they already have um, because um, they might be able to get a higher payment uh, if they were able to evict. Um, but, you know, that's just my intuition. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that holds out, but uh, I can't say yet. Yeah, and I think we're also seeing an increase of end of lease term evictions where, you know, landlords are just not renewing uh, the lease because they want to raise it or they raise it so high that, you know, the tenant can't commit. So we're seeing uh, more of that happening now as well. Um, I believe on one of your slides, this is what this question is from, but for tenant resources, EPC was mentioned. What does EPC stand for and who, who are they? Well, I'm sorry, I should, have, uh, I should have spelled it out. That's the Eviction Prevention Court. That's the name of the program that is uh, run by the Friends Association in Chester County. Okay, great. Uh, in, your, in your research, did you see that there, if there's any help for people who are removed from their place or residence due to code violations on part of the landlord? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, um, not a lawyer, but I know that that could be that that's potentially a uh, a defense um, that could be raised in a case. But I can't say any more than that, unfortunately. Correct. Correct. So that that would go to you. You may not be a lawyer, but you're right on uh, that. Goes to the habitability issues with the property, typically. Um, and again, I would refer that family to to reach out to legal aid of Southeastern PA. They won't. I believe they're not typically. Um, suing landlords, but they can certainly provide advice on some self-advocacy there, I believe, as well. Um, another question came in, do NDJs uh, simply volunteer to set up eviction prevention programs, or do they need to get approval from the local borough, or do you know the, the motivation of the existing NDJs to participate? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, both of these programs really have pretty close personal connections with uh, the uh, MDJs that are participating. Um, not necessarily at the beginning of the process, but as they went through the process, they built those relationships. Um, one thing I do believe that does need to be done is the presiding judge, the president judge of the county courts does need to approve this uh, program. Um, but it, it all these, both of these programs were really voluntary in, in the terms of, you know, which judges wanted to work with them. And it was, you know, it was a very uh, kind of a, uh, person-to-person uh, -person process as far as um, I've heard from those programs. Um, the diversion programs you highlighted in Chester County and Reading are encouraging. Uh, any idea how reliant that progress was on the emergency rental assistance program, or was it more to do with the programmatic support, like making sure tenants appear in court, legal assistance, or mediators helping with communication? Uh, that's a really good question, and uh, we're hoping to look further into that. Um, I think I think uh, ERAP, the rental system, was really crucial um, because that is, you know, that is a program that had a whole bunch of resources that was able to address the, uh, the arrears issue. Um, but uh, I think it's kind of the case of, um, you know, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't sufficient by itself, right? So we, one thing that was really crucial is for the tenants to be understand what the process is and for them to have access to people who can advocate for them. Um, and for, you know, uh, these applications are, are, can be fairly difficult process to navigate, uh, especially if, you know, a, a low income um, person might not have regular income, might not be filing taxes. Um, there are a lot of documentation that can be required. So the, uh, the support that was given by the programs in terms of first letting people know that this resource exists and um, to help them um, navigate 
that process was, I think, also really important, more than just the availability of the money. And of course, the actual legal assistance, um, being able to having to have a person who can negotiate with the landlord, because oftentimes there is a breakdown in communication between the landlord and tenant, and this kind of third party can help bridge that gap. Right. I will say that, and you all didn't mention this in your presentation, but I'll mention it now, the EPIC program in Montgomery County did start before the this influx of money with the emergency rental assistance program and is doing great. And I believe they're still working, you know, now it's in conjunction with the emergency rental assistance program. But that was, you know, the Help Spark Foundation, Your Way Home, and a whole host of community partners that really got together and, and got that effort off the ground. So they they certainly have a money aspect to it. There's money there, but um, you know, that wasn't based solely upon the emergency rental assistance program, but operates very similarly to what we heard um, here today with some of the other programs. So this person has another question, so they were late to join, but asked, can you speak to the eviction issues and rates in immigrant and refugee communities? And did you mention how courts and other resources have tailored their services to these communities? And what would you, just, what would you suggest as the best practices there? Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question because I, I'm an immigrant myself. And, um, you know, one thing that does raise is that um, there are a lot of folks who um, might be experiencing a lot of instability and displacement that we wouldn't really see through this data, because especially, um, you know, if legal status might be a concern, then, you know, people might have uh, might be even more vulnerable to pressure to you know, move out with, even without an eviction being filed. Um, that said, uh, you know, one thing that I find really interesting about the Berks County program in Reading is that they also, you know, they they have multilingual support. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's in general a really important, um, uh, really important question because um, things can be even more vulnerable for people, um, you know, who don't speak English and who, uh, might not be able, uh, who might have concerns about reaching out to uh, governments in order to seek help. I agree. I would agree. Um, we kind of, you know, we often define that population internally kind of as this, you know, once they're evicted, obviously, but it'll be kind of this sort of hidden homelessness population, right? They um, certainly are, are fearful of some of these systems, right? Rightfully so. And I think rather than engaging and sometimes utilizing the rights that are available to them, right, as you mentioned, they, they sort of you know shy away from those systems and and unfortunately in doing so right as you mentioned again are not captured in this data right and and not only the immigrant community but we see that with families as well uh, with our work at the foundation you know engaging in these systems is disruptive right and it's and it's invasive and as the data showed oftentimes not in your favor and if you're second time or third time going down this road you know how it goes and you know you just sometimes don't engage. So that's that's an important question and certainly a, a question we need to keep in consideration as we work on this this effort going forward. Um, one thing, um, this is kind of just a comment, I guess, and I'd like to see you guys' reaction is one thing I noticed that was particular about these two programs, and this was addressed a little bit earlier, but I'd like to hear more, is that these programs are not singular in their solutions, right? They combine multiple different points of intervention in their programs. And in your conversations with them, they speak about the importance of these multiple interventions versus just, for example, paying rent or providing counsel. So I assume all of this, this was intentional. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, they, they learned a lot from the EPIC program, which I think has a lot of the same parts. Um, and yeah, I think having really a lot, a lot of what's going on here is really empowering people to really advocate um, and, um, you know, you can't advocate for yourself. We don't know, know what's available to you. Um, and I think that's an important part of that. And um, just because the process can be really jarring, right? And unexpected and um, can move quickly once it's filed. Uh, I, I think that's also suggests that it's really important to have multiple kind of potential um, points of intervention. Did, did either of those programs talk about the obstacles that they faced in, in creating uh, their program? Um, one, thing, uh, one thing we've heard is kind of finding, um, because legal assistance is a crucial part of this, finding enough um, kind of staff hours for lawyers to come and help, uh, especially because it's a really fast 
moving in, environment. Um, that that I think has been a challenge. Um, and another is kind of I you know these programs started fairly small, uh, but you know scaling up also requires more resources and more coordination. Um, and you know building more partnerships, and that also always takes time. I think also another big challenge um, that these programs have to negotiate is, you know, making sure that they always appear as kind of balanced and fair, that they're not necessarily, you know, trying to get tenants off from not paying rent, but <clears throat> really trying to provide support to both sides, support to the tenant as they go through this process, but also making sure that a landlord is made whole because that needs to happen as well. And so sometimes when uh, it seems like one side is being favored or the tenant is being favored more, that, that can put up some uh, defenses or alarms or, or create some apprehension from partners in the courts specifically. I also noticed that you mentioned 17% of the evictions filed were less than for less than $1000, right? Which which I thought was was really striking in that we, again, we know how eviction disrupts people's lives, right? Being evicted requires people to come up with significant financial resources to move, you know, they're going to be required again to pay first, last security and potentially replace their belongings forces them to move to locations where they don't have family, right? Friends or support systems. And to think about that we're putting people potentially through this disruption for less than a thousand dollars really, really uh, hit home. And I thought that was an important point you made and kind of just stood out there. And I, I'm curious to hear you all's reaction to that. That's particular statistic. Yeah, and that's seventeen percent, including all the costs and fees and everything else. That is only there because the eviction was filed. Um, so percentage is even greater if you just consider the rent and arrears. Um, so yeah, I, I think I would agree everything you just said, Ruben. Uh, yeah, I think it also speaks to um, some landlords are using the eviction process for rent collection, right? And um, you know, is this the best use of the legal system? Is this, you know, really uh, something that should kind of be allowed, right? Like you can't just file frivolous lawsuits, but you know, your, your tenant is five days late, you don't have to do anything else and you know, you can file. So, I mean, what are, are the, the, sys the systemic things that we need to change to make sure that there are other options to support rent collection for landlords if there is a problem with the tenancy. Exactly. So last question, another, if there was one thing you wanted folks to take away from today's webinar, we received a lot of great information. Uh, what would that be and why? For me, for uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, for me, it would be just that eviction is just not some rare problem that can be ignored. Um, you know, there are communities in Delaware County where a full tenth of the renter families living there got an eviction filing in 2021. Um, I, I, I mean, uh, I, I don't know what to say more other than that. It just that's a crisis, and that that can't. Uh, you know, I, I wish uh, that couldn't really pass without action um, because that's you know that that affects uh, many thousands of families throughout the county. Yeah, I would just say you know, landlord tenant and eviction is is or eviction is not a landlord tenant issue. It very much is a community issue and has ripple effects that are felt in every other facet of life and neighborhood. Uh, but there are many places to start. There is no wrong place to start. So, you know, just find uh, a couple of key partners, find your champion, uh, stick a, a stake in the ground and just start there. Great, thank you. So we're getting close to the end here. So I, on behalf of HOPE at the Foundation for Delaware County, thank you to the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania for presenting at today's webinar on the state of eviction PA and a deep dive into Delaware County data. I encourage all of you to email the Housing Alliance at info at housingalliance.org and indicate if you would like to sign up for their newsletter and or even better, become an official member of the Housing Alliance and be a part of the great work that they are doing not only in Delaware County, 
but across the state of Pennsylvania. And they will also, you can also feel free to ask uh, for a PDF copy of the report. I encourage everyone to look at that, read it, learn it, and let's let's make changes uh, moving forward based on the information in that report. Um, and thank you all for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.